All right, church, today we are in Acts chapter 17, and this is a great chapter. It kind of rolls out in three different acts. Um, we're catching up with Paul on his second missionary journey. And at first he's in Thessalonica, and then he's going to go to Berea, and then we're going to end the chapter in Athens. And so starting out, um, uh, Paul is preaching in the synagogues that existed in Thessalonica, and the Jews there that were against him started stirring up trouble, and they chased him down, and they went to the house of a man named Jason who the apostles were staying at. And not finding the apostles, they dragged Jason into the courts. And look what it says in verse 6. It says, When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. What's great about this line is we get an indication of what's going on in the first century with the church. Um, where it says that they've upset the whole world. It says in the New King James, it's also translated as they've turned the whole world upside down. This is the effect that the gospel is having wherever it goes. As it goes into these, these dark pagan societies, as people are converted, it actually changes the economy. There's a lot of people who made a lot of money selling um, idols and things for people to worship that people didn't worship those anymore. And it caused problems in families and it caused people that were turning away from their false idols and their false gods and turning to the one true God. And it's this indication of what the gospel does when it reaches people is it changes people. In fact, there's nothing that's off limits from the gospel. The gospel, when it goes into any culture, any society, any person, it's going to transform everything. It transforms how they spend their money. It transforms how they spend their time. What kinds of relationships? What's the nature of those relationships? And so early on, we find because of this huge revival that's happening in Europe and, and in Asia in the first century, we find that the whole world has been turned upside down. This is probably 15 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And so this is about 15 years into the church history, and already it is having this huge impact on the world. Well, Paul and the apostles escape from there, and they go to Berea. And we get this line in Berea that is just really um, warms a pastor's heart, people who are like the Bereans. It says in verse 10, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. You know, as a pastor, that's what we want. I don't want you just to take my word for it. I want you to examine the scriptures and find out if it's so. You know, one of the reasons we're doing this study through the book of Acts is so that we can examine the scriptures together and we can ask ourselves, is this true? Is what I believe true? And that's what the Bereans were doing. So Paul goes on from Berea and he comes to Athens, right? Athens is one of the great cities um, uh, of, of antiquity. And he goes there and, he, and he, you, you'll see this, this um, pattern that Paul, he goes to the synagogues, which is where the Jews would worship. And then he goes in the marketplace and he evangelizes the Gentiles. And so he goes to the marketplace in Athens. Athens is kind of the seat of this Greek thinking and Greek philosophers and Stoics and all these people who um, kind of were, uh, you know, poets and philosophers and thought deeply about the world. And, and they invited Paul um, to a place called the Areopagus or um, Areopagus. The Areopagus was a place where um, it's, it's called Mars Hill. It's a place where um, the seat of kind of the city council where they would judge things, but they'd also come and listen to people teach. And so Paul comes there and he starts his sermon on Mars Hill, which is one of the greatest sermons um, in, the, uh, in the epistles. And, um, and here we find in Acts and we find um, uh, Paul preaching to these Gentiles. And look what he says, verse 22. So Paul stood in the midst of the, of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. What's really fascinating about this is that they've done some archaeological um, research on, on some of these things. They've actually found some of these, um, these, these statues that have been dedicated to the unknown God. Well, the Apostle Paul is going to find something that they already believe in, right? They, on Mars Hill, they would have all these statues and all these idols to all these different gods they would worship. Well, on Mars Hill, Paul saw one that was, that was to the unknown God. Now, what they found out in research is that Paul actually probably knew something very significant about the Athenian culture and about the Greek gods. And that this God, the unknown God, was actually had a story behind it. Um, Back in, in the 6th century BC, so about 500 years before this, um, there was a great plague that went throughout Greece. 
and um, and you know they 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 worship a pantheon of gods and all these different gods, and so they started sacrificing all these gods to try to make the the plague go away, and um, and and it just did not relent. It just kept up, kept up, kept up. And so they started to think, maybe we've offended some unknown God. And so they started to pray to the unknown God. And they started to make sacrifices to the unknown God, and the plague went away. You know, what's fascinating is kind of we're in our own situation with this, um, uh, with this pandemic, right? It's sort of like a plague. And um, our, really our only hope is in the God of, of the universe, the one true God, that he might help us and and touch us and, and grant us repentance and and uh, make this plague go away and so the apostle paul points to that statue and says i'm here to tell you about your unknown god this god you've already worshiped i want to tell you who he really is that he can be known it says the god who made the world and all things in it since he is the lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. You know, God is everywhere. We don't have to go somewhere far away to find him. In fact, right now, wherever you're at, watching this on your phone or your computer, God is with you. And even more than that, he's with your neighbors. Now, the difference is, you know this God. You have a relationship with him. You've come to believe and know who he really is. But so many of our neighbors, they don't know who he is. I was talking to my neighbor this morning and She's full of anxiety and full of fear and trying to wash everything all the time and trying to keep her kids safe. Man, our neighbors need to know about the unknown God, that they can know him, that he's the one true God. And so I really feel like there's an opportunity for us as the church to reach out to them and do exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing here in Athens and teach people that they can know the unknown God. God bless you guys.